A national parents group is investigating rhetoric they believe is being used to justify the October 7th massacre in the classroom while college female student athletes are taking a stand to prevent transgender athletes from taking the court uh, or the field. Joining us now to discuss is Nicole Neely, the president of Parents Defending Education. Good morning, Nicole. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Well, let's first talk about what your organization is doing. Parents Defending Education is tracking land acknowledgments by school districts across the country. Now, according to Webster's, this is a statement that recognizes the indigenous peoples who were the original habitats, inhabitants of that land. Now, what is your concern here? Sure. Well, one concern is just that this is just straight up virtue signaling. I mean, you're not actually doing anything. You're saying, OK, yeah, we stole the land. Oops, sorry, moving on. But beyond that, I think what it really starts to do is it starts to plant the idea in children's heads that they're on stolen land. And as you said in your opening, this was used to justify the murder of infants in Israel on October 7th, that that was on stolen land as well. And so if it's justified to commit murder of innocents to repatriate stolen land there, why, of course, it would be justified here as well. And that's wrong. And I think that kind of goes into another uh, concern that you have with the term settler colonialism. There's something that's been used by many pro-Palestinian groups, you know, to describe Israel. You say that term is making its way into the classrooms. But what are parents telling you and also the ramifications of this, especially the context sure. of the Israel-Hamas war? Absolutely. We've seen this term used over and over again. Um, definitely in, in ethnic studies curriculum, but in many social studies and history curriculums from across the globe. And again, it is looking at the world in one snapshot, snapshot in time. So it's looking at Israel in the context of 1948, but what about the mm -hmm. thousands of years before that? Or the thousands of years here in America? Or the thousands of years in Europe? At what point does someone have complete and total you know, claim over a land and no one else is ever allowed to say that again? Um, be, this rhetoric is used to justify, um, you know, oppressing people, throwing up barriers to people. Um, in the words of Imram Kendi, um, past discrimination is justification for, for current and future discrimination. And so we worry again that this is being taught to children at very, very young ages where they don't really fully understand what these terms mean, but it is used as a derogatory term and, and really is, is uh, hijacking history. Do you think it is also used to dehumanize? Because you think of 1948, you think of right after the Holocaust. And Absolutely, yes. And so it's saying these people are unequivocally bad, period. Not without looking at the historical context or many of the other obviously complicated situations that are taking place, you know, in the wake in the wake of World War II or other historical incidents. Right. On the college level, this is just so fascinating. We have, uh, we're seeing a revolt really in women's co collegiate volleyball. You have five college women's volleyball teams who have forfeited matches against San Jose State University because they have a transgender athlete playing on a team. Now, usually in situations like this, when you look back through history, often rules are changed when people who are impacted take a stand. Do you think that these athletes forfeiting the game is going to put more pressure, not only on collegiate sports, but just across the board, leading to maybe change in, cha a change in rules. Absolutely. I, I think it's really encouraging. I think it's sad that these 18, 19, 20-year-old girls have to be the ones who are saying, don't put us in harm's way. But them speaking up, I mean, I think it does put pressure on the administrations and the coaches who have been silent in this until this point. I think I, um, one of my coworkers is a former collegiate coach, and he said, one reason that they're not speaking on is that coaches' jobs are on the line here. If they lose because of an athlete who has superior physical strength, bone density, strong muscles, et cetera, um, beating their team, then of course that, you know, that coach is going to say, all right, well, we need our own person with that a skill set and that ability. And so there is this very toxic stew right now, but these girls stepping out saying, please don't hurt me. This is my sport. I deserve to be here is very, very powerful. So I'm optimistic. And very quickly here, a Pennsylvania court has ruled in favor of parents who accused a Pennsylvania public school district, uh, Mount Lebanon in Allegheny County of violating their civil rights by teaching first grade children concepts such as gender dysphoria and gender transition. Do you see this case in some ways becoming a blueprint for the rest of the country? I think there's a real possibility. These were very young children and the parents not only did not know what the curriculum was, but they did not have the opportunity even to opt their children out of this curriculum. And so I think that again, and, and focusing on very young ages really drives home the point that parents do deserve to have a measure of knowledge and control over what their children are learning. Um, and that schools don't have unfettered rights to just have children for eight hours a day and talk about whatever they want to these small children. All right, Nicole Neely, Parents Defending Education, thanks for joining us. Thank you.